Hello and welcome to a very special bonus episode of the Paul Ryder Tapes. We have got an icon of 90s Manchester culture. He was with Paul through the brightest and the darkest of times and lived through his own struggles but came through smiling. He's another person offering hope to those of you out there who might be struggling. He roaded for the Mondays in the very early days and shuffled his stuff on stage with the roses. It is the mighty, the legendary, the lovely Cressa. Hiya, I'm Cressa. <laughs> I used to know a horse, Paul Ryder, from ooh, back in the day. We were good pals. We were in the same music. Drugs, clobber, and women. Unfortunately, the same women at some times, but hey ho, such is life for a young man. <laughs> yeah, so horse with horse and cressa with cressa. <laughs> yeah, lovely geezer, sort one. I don't think we've I don't think we've ever met. Have we ever met? It looks I think we have met, but not not yeah, um... we, we have, we have. But I've I've heard I've kept track of you over, over the Yes, so yeah, I'm really glad that you're doing really well. That's brilliant, really well, good. I won't say really well, but I'm, I'm a lot. I'm, you know, back on my feet. I'm, you know, I'm keeping yeah. on, keeping on. Great, yeah. good for you, good for you. No, it's it's a major, major. I mean, I know I've lived through stuff with Paul, so I know yeah. how. I know what. <laughs> I know about the struggle. <laughs> I know about yeah. the struggle. Yeah. So congratulations, that's really brilliant. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I was begging on the street. I was, I was out there. <laughs> I, I was, you know, lost everything. Didn't have, a, didn't have nothing. I was, yeah. But you're in a, you're a kind of beacon of hope, aren't you, for other people who might be going well, through something similar. Well, thankfully, uh, Dave Aslam wrote that book about me, and um, last year we did a few book, you know, sort of blah. And that was really good because people got a really good vibe off it that I was, you know, that, you know. But I mean, there's a lot of people that have been there and come back. But it was just nice that to be vindicated, you know. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. You're I just have a little bit yeah. of me talking juice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so when did you first meet Paul? Hacienda. Um yeah. Got to have been about 85. The Mondays were just starting to hang about in there, and I was hanging about in there all the time. And my mate, little Martin, was at, uh, who ended up becoming uh, Mike Pickering's right hand man, MP Square, doing the house music. But this was before that. He was a DJ in the ass. And we used to do a night, well, I say we, I, it, I'd always be there with him. Um, a psychedelic night on the Tuesdays in the, in the downstairs bar. And uh, I think they, they, the Mondays had come over from rehearsing at the boardwalk and there'd only be about them and maybe four or five other people. It, it wasn't very successful. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, you know, and then uh, then Bez started turning up and he's like, whoa, he's a character. So, you know, we started meeting them and a bum bum. But, um, yeah, also, we just got on from the, from the off. I mean, it was, it was Paul that first said to me, jump, on the, jump in the van, you know, to come to a gig. Which was like, which was great. I mean, the first two times, I got stood up. <laughs> I went. I waited outside the boardwalk for about two hours, and oh, they must have already gone. <laughs> I went all the way up to Swinton one time on a bus and waited there. I thought, they're not coming, are they? <laughs> but the third time, I got in because it was a transit van in them days. You know, it was it was, you know, it was proper basic. And that once the first time I got in the back of the van with them, that was it. I was there for every gig after that. And it was Horse that said, you know, come on, Chris. <laughs> Tell me about him in those early days. He was a little bit in shadow of Sean, obviously, because Sean has his massive character and ego. But Horse had his own uh, personality as well. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to copy, he wasn't in any way mimicking Sean or, any, you know, he, he was his own man. And, you know, he had his own his own definite ideas about music and style and everything. I mean, that first album that they did, his bass playing is just, oh, 
Ah, oh, for me, that's the Mondays is the first album, the twenty four hour fight. People possibly hey, can't smile like that. That for me is that that's the Mondays for me because that was when I was in the back of the van with them and going places. I mean, <laughs> let me think. Camden's Dingwall, yeah, Dingwall in Camden, nineteen eighty, early eighty six. There was a there's a McDonald's around the corner, and uh, we've gone around there and got a cup of coffee each. Gone upstairs, uh, put a gram of whiz each in our cups, drank that. So after that, every time we did a gig, it was like, Chris, we're going for a spicy brew. All right, then, yeah, let's find a McDonald's. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the joke. Then every time after his sound, once he'd done his sound check, Chris, spicy brew. Come on, then, I'm coming then. <laughs> But it was, you know, with with us, it was his laugh. He just had that. I don't, I, I can't do it, but <laughs> just the way he'd just do that. <laughs> you know, it was like a, it was almost like a cough and a laugh. It was just like a bark almost. But it was, uh, no, that was, yeah. I was I was very um, I was touched when I saw Linda at the funeral actually, because she said to me, he always spoke very highly of you, Chris. And I haven't seen I haven't seen us for about 15, 20 years. And I, I I was I was in tears at that because oh for fuck's sake. You know, but people they separate and you have your own lives, you know what I mean? He's over in the States. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry, I'm sorry for waving my hands. <laughs> my jazz hands. <laughs> no, you know, it's like bah. No, he did. He always spoke very highly of you. But the last the, the, it, the last time I was in touch with him was a gig at the academy. And he, you know, he put me on the list, and uh, I was there, and I got that drunk. I thought oh, I'm not going bothering going backstage, and and I also thought even if I was sober in Manchester, the backstage for a Monday's gig is just going to be chocker of dead legs and every hangers on it. Not even what I tried to get in and see anyone, you know. So I just left it, so I didn't even get to see him then, which is a shame, but such is life, yeah. you know. Do you remember the last time you saw him? Yeah, it possibly was a uh, backstage at an Ian Brown show at the arena. I can't think what year, but I remember he was there. So I, you know, I saw I saw him then. But after that, I'm not. No, I think that was probably the last time. But I mean, when you when you mates with someone, and then you see, you don't think of oh, when you see him or not. You know, it, it's like oh. Oh, I bloody hell, I saw bloody uh, Wayne Rooney yesterday. You'd remember when it was, you know what I mean? But if it's your pal, uh, you know, because that's, that's how it was to me, he's my pal. <laughs> yeah. So let's just go back to Bloody, only, 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 only man who bloody made me have an injection of heroin. <laughs> a rogue. What, did he get yeah. you into it? Well, no, I was, I'd, I'd, had, I'd had smack, yeah. And he was like, he's. Got, I was living in Charlotte. He's going, oh, let's go and get some. Oh, all right, let's get some gear. Yeah, I thought he was going to go and have a smoke. No, I, I'd done it before. Oh, you know, now and again, you know, nothing. We turn up at this this house in off Kingsway, Withington, Didsbury, somewhere like that, and uh, they're cooking up. They're cooking up and using needles. I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? And he goes to the lad who's who's gone. No, oh, Chris is all right. He's he, he, he'll be all right. I'm like, well, all right, okay then. Bang, the next thing I know, <laughs> I've got my head hanging out of his car door, vomiting as we're careering all over Kingsway at about three o'clock in the morning. How we didn't crash or get arrested, I will never know to this day. We were driving about four miles an hour, just going across the road in zigzags. Oh, God. It's, you look back and go, ha, 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 ha. But at the time, oh, Oh, I just remember me head outside the car, vomiting all down the side. Oh, I, I could have turned blue. I, you know, it could have been touch. You know, it's like, but hey, hey, such is life. <laughs> such is life. Uh, I mean, that's the only time I've ever. That was the one and only time I ever dug it. <laughs> nice one, Paul. Cheers, mate. <laughs> well, no, it kind of made me think. I ain't going there again. So in a way, it was a good thing because, you know, there's a lot of junkies, a lot of smackheads who, because, you know, if you toot it, then you get a tolerance, then it's, um, 
oh, well, I'll have a gig, and then it really, really works. But only works for about a week, and then after that, you've really got to start. And then that's you know you lose all your veins. I mean, <laughs> I've got veins everywhere. I mean, man, I've been sat with places and people looking up, going, "Oh, I love them veins." <laughs> Too bad, mate. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, I haven't fucked my body up that bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> I drew a line in the sand at that one. You know, I'll sit on the floor and beg, but I ain't doing that. So, no needles. Nah, not for me. Because it no, takes you a whole, cool. it takes you a whole way further down the line if you know what I mean, you know it's you know, a it's very cool. it's a very dark horrible path that you know it's i wouldn't well, recommend I've, it I've, always, I've, I've always i've always thought as heroin as being a mistress because you don't want to tell anyone about her so she's always in the dark you know it's always hush 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 you know you don't say oh hey look i'm going you know it's and she's a very seductive mistress <laughs> and at the end, she'll be really nice to you, but by the end, oh, uh, she'll ruin you. <laughs> and that's 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 the one way that I've always thought about heroin is uh, she is a a, um, a seductive mistress. Because, like I say, you don't want people to know, so you keep her on the quiet. That's what you do with a mistress, isn't it? Nobody knows, yeah. and then <laughs> then she starts taking over. <laughs> Is there a code where, like, obviously, Paul knew that you were doing it, you knew Paul was doing it. Is it like a kind of code between you that you kind of keep it to yourselves, but you know that you're, you're both in that same club? I was never really addicted when I knew. Uh, I'd, I'd have a little dabble, uh, you know. At one time, Sean said to me, Fucking hell, Chris. You're the only man I know who can smoke a gram of smack and not want any the next day, and because I could, I could have it, I could do it one day and then just not even want it, and I wouldn't touch it for months. But once, so when I, you know, that's why I went on that time with us. It was like, yeah, we're going to have a smoke. I didn't realize we we're going to have a dig, but I didn't want any the next day either. I was, it's all of a sudden you get to the point when it's like, I need it every day. Well, it's not. Well, it's, well, first it's a want every day, and then it's the need every day, which is a lot worse. So he talked. He talked quite a lot about um, his his mental health breakdowns that were that came right. after the after the heroin got a grip of him, and he was uh -huh. in he was in the grips of that. It, it basically sent him to having to to being in a mental institution. Basically, he completely lost the plot and. Um, and I think, I don't know, it's very brave of him to, to be that open about that, but I think he, he kind it. of wanted to share his experience to, so that other people could see that you can come yeah. out of that. There yeah, is yeah, a way yeah. out of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that was like me with this book with Aslam. You just got, if you be honest about what's occurred, you can either it maybe not stop other people getting there, but you can help them when they're in that situation that they know there is a way out of the pit. You know, there is a ladder, a rope ladder that can be dropped down into the dark pit so you can climb out, you know. That's if you want to. A lot of people don't want to climb out of the pit. They're quite happy to be in it. Yeah, but. So did, did Dave approach you about doing the book? Was it his idea? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> he's a sneaky one that day, Aslam. He said he wanted to do a book about bands in Manchester that had never, you know, made it. So he wanted to talk about my band, the Bad Man Wagon, that, you know, from like the mid, the mid late nineties, and he said, you know, he's going to do all these other bands, and uh, so we met up and we had a chat, and then uh, he said we'll meet again in a couple of weeks. Said, okay, Dave, yeah, and then when he came back to me, he said, um, well, I was thinking I might just write the book about you, Chris. I said, <laughs> Pamper my ego, why don't you? <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course. No, so I think he had it in his mind in the first place. He was sounding me out to see how, you know, to see where I was at and what was occurring. Because I bumped into him. I was still homeless and begging at the time, and I saw him one time. And he said, oh, take my number, because I'd like to have a chat with you. So maybe he wanted to do it. I don't know. But anyway, he did it, and it's, uh, it's a great little one-hour read. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. What's the book called? Not all roses. Not all roses. Oh, what a brilliant title! 
The Life and Times of Stephen Cresser. <laughs> so you were with the Roses for a while, weren't you? Was that kind of yeah, 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 yeah. Tell me a little I was, bit about uh, that. Well, I first started out in the back of the bus with the Mondays. And then after a time, in fact, it was after Finsbury Park in, it must have been 86, it was a factory do with uh, ACR, New Order and the Railway Children. <laughs> um, the manager at the time, Phil Sachs, said, Cref, because he had a bit of a lift, Cref, you're always in the van, why don't you help Horseman and if he can come and we'll pay you £20 a show. I said, all right, Phil. And so that's how I got into rodeoing. Um, and then the John and Ian, who was me other pals with Roses, said, oh, well, if you, you know, work for us, oh, okay, boom, boom, boom. If you're doing that, do this, boom, boom, boom. But then it came to the point where there were conflicting shows. So I had to make a decision. And um, as much as it hurt me, I went with the roses, not because it hurt me. Because I, I went with the roses be, for two reasons. One, because I'd known them longer, and also because I was on stage <laughs> uh, doing something. So it was a bit of ego thrown in there as well. So, I but as Sean, we were in Leeds, and I've said, Sean, I'm not going to be at the next show, and you're a traitor, Chris. You're a traitor. Well, as I got off and got in a car to drive off, Bez and Horse was like, all right, see you later, Chris. See you later, mate. So, you know, but Sean came around in it. He was a bit upset that, yeah. you know. But, hey, I had to make a I couldn't be in two places at once. Describe what you were doing with the roses on stage. I was doing John Squire's guitar effects and then yeah. dancing like a berserk thing. So you were like their, you were like their Bez, really, weren't you? Yeah, with better moves, man, better moves. Come on. Come on. <laughs> to this day, we've had this conversation, Bez and I, and I think he defers to me in the end. <laughs> no, he doesn't really, but, you know, <laughs> we have we have had this chat. Well, we've had, it's been said in when we've both been there a couple of times, and I've said, I have stated I'm the better dancer. Or I was the better dancer. You know, we're all men now. In the day, you just check check out that Blackpool vid, the roses. You'll see some moves, baby. Right, I'm going to look some up on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the roses at Blackpool, yeah, 1989. Oh, I'm, I'm on fire. I'm on fire. Are you still friends with all the roses? Manny and Ian... Rennie and me never got on, so that's not a problem. And I don't know what happened with John Squire. Uh, we were still really good friends up until about 10 years ago, and uh, all of a sudden, like, a gate was closed. And I don't know what... This is before I was even strung out on gear, yeah, you know. A gate just came down, and that was it. Boom, I cut out of his life, which was quite hurtful, to be honest with you. I had lunch with Ian not so long ago. It's Manny was at his 60th not so long ago. Uh, yeah, so in that respect, yeah, but John, never understand. I don't know what occurred. Don't know why he fell out with me. But John's one of those people once he's made, you know, that's it. Boom. So what do you want to do next? Like, what's the next thing for you in your life? No, at the minute, I, I, I make it, I'm trying to make some tunes again with uh, the bass player from the Bad Man Wagon, my old pal Winker Watson. We just want to try and get four or five tunes together, get them on a laptop do a bit of DJ and throw them in. See, I don't know, just, you're just uh, doing that anyway. And um, Do you have any funny memories of, any anecdotes that, you, that you'd that you want to tell, just to scrape? She got we were going to um, record the album, and um, <laughs> it's the end of journalists there. And so, uh, <laughs> so this, this journalist has said, oh, yeah, 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 you're flying to New York next week, I hear. And Bez has gone, Flying ants! And Ars just fell about laughing. It was rolling about on the floor because it was just, it was a beautiful Bez moment and it was a beautiful Ars moment because he was just, he was literally, he couldn't stop laughing. And so afterwards, we'd always say, 
fly you nonce. And he, you know, we know that was like one of our little little go to jokes. Fly you nonce. <laughs> he was literally on the floor rolling it. it and Bez was like, what, what? Because he didn't, he, you know. <laughs> no, that's, that's one of my favourite moments with Oz, because he was just, like, just so natural. Tell me about um, Derek's relationship with the rest of the crew. When I first started working, well, like the first time I was supposed to work for them, I, I pushed the boxes, I'm getting it all out, I'm setting everything up, bum, 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 bum. And then it comes to cabling up, and Horseman's come up to me and gone, listen, Chris, I'm the kind of man who's going to go around and check everything. So just leave it to me. You just put everything in place, and I'll do it. Fine by me, Horseman. You mean I've got less work to do? <laughs> Brilliant. Horse, spicy brew, let's go. <laughs> you know, no, Horseman, I mean, he was the driver, uh, Sean used to just call him worker and because that's what he was. He would not stop. He was driving. He was lo and before I started helping him, he he was doing. He was loading everything, setting everything up, cabling everything, taking it down, re-putting it in the van, driving them back wherever it was. Right, the next oh, he was. He had some oomph about him, ass man, because he just wanted it for his lads. He was, I know in it. I think in a way he was vicariously enjoying it, you know, because it, you know, he used to write, he used to write jokes for send them into two minds and stuff like that, didn't he? So, you know, he always wanted to be there, obviously. And so he was just, can you imagine how proud he was of his lads with the, doing what they did? Yeah. And he, he was, he would, he wouldn't stop. He was, yeah, no, he was, he was a geezer. Yeah. And, and the, yeah. did the crew relate to Derek like he was a, a dad of Sean and Paul, or was he one of the lads? No, they they tro they tro other than, I mean, Sean used to give him a bit, not even a stick. But I remember one time I, I was like, come on, Derek, I'm just about to have a spliff. And Sean said, come on. You know, he's like, show a bit of respect. You know, come on, you're working. You know, it's like, there was a thin line, but I mean, it, it, all the others, Treated Horseman as like the boss, you know what I mean? It, I mean, obviously, Sean and Paul, you know, dad in it, so there's a bit of a, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's not as bad as the time. I remember Horse trying to hit Sean over the head with his bass guitar, that was a good one, <laughs> in West Berlin. <laughs> it, we're on stage, they're on stage, and this was West Berlin, that's how long ago it was, and it, I don't know what had been said at the end of some song, you know, either, you know, Sean's probably said, so, oh, you're out of tune, you know, something like, oh, she just took it off and just went, he swung it like an axe. Ooh, thankfully, he fucking missed it. So then, yeah, fucking, I think Muzzer was there, he jumped on it, and the horseman jumped on stage. And I think, oh, calm down, five minutes later, right? And then they finished the show, but it was uh, quite entertaining. <laughs> oh, happy. If you'd have hit but that's brothers. Uh, could have been that could have been something from when they were four, you know, and uh, over an action man or something, you know, something that's been built up for years. You just don't know, do we, brothers? What about backstage in the dressing rooms? What sort of stuff was going on there after oh, the gig? X-rated. Come on. <laughs> what was going? What wasn't going on? I'm surprised I've still got any nostrils. Until ecstasy arrived, it was. Predominantly amphetamine and marijuana. And once the E's arrived, it was, well, no, obviously with LSD. Obviously with LSD as well. Yeah. Tell me about when Ecstasy arrived and how that affected the band and the music. Well, you can hear it, can't you? You know, you can hear it drifting in at the end of the second of Bond and then pills, thrills, and belly ache. Wow, it's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? <laughs> Was it a good thing for their musical development evolution? Yeah, they didn't do no harm. And no, it, Pill Thrills, it's a great album. I don't know, Ecstasy. For me, it was, I just thought it was great. <laughs> but I think we all did. <clears throat> when it landed in the Hacienda, wow. 
for about, I don't know, say six weeks. That was like the, the they call it, the, you know, they re, they, well, this new, the second summer of, it really was a summer of love. And I see you could go, you'd go, and it was, wow. Everyone was just, oh, no, there really was something happening. And then, unfortunately, after about that long, a few people realised there was a lot of money to be made. And that's when um, the darker forces started turning up, you know, i.e. gangsters wanting to make money, and that's everything goes downhill then. I remember going to the Hacienda in that summer and everybody was wearing Stone Roses t-shirts and I was like, who are they? But like every other person in the Hacienda was literally wearing us and I didn't know who they were and I had to find out when I got home. It's crazy, it was, yeah. the, it was the Beatles and the Rolling yeah. Stones. Yeah. Was, <laughs> the Stone Roses it? and the Happy Mondays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it really was. Was there, a, was there a big sense of camaraderie between the two bands? I mean, I know that they're great friends yeah. now. Yeah. There was no animosity whatsoever. I, 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 you know, I mean, there's a, you can look it up. There's a snub TV video of the Roses from the Hacienda. And I'm at the back there behind John doing my ting, wearing an Happy Mondays T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Which I just thought, I just thought, well, yeah, it's it's the right thing to wear, isn't it? It's just, a, you know, it's what we do. It's who we are, and you know, I know. I'm quite happy I did that actually, because it's, you know, it, it, I I think it shows the time. It, it, there was no animosity between them whatsoever. Yeah. They were both on top of the pops in the same yeah. episode, and I wasn't there. I was on over at the old set because they were only miming anyway, so they didn't need me to do John's thing. I was, uh, you know, uh, so <laughs> apparently Tony Wilson backstage has gone, um, well, because Ian and uh, Ian and Gaz Whelan had the same, was it Versace? Some bloody designer shirt, like a high collared bloody thing. And he's gone, uh, well, our drummer has got the same shirt as your singer. So our band must be better than your band. You know, if our drummer can wear the same shirt, then he's better, you know. I, only Anthony H. Wilson could come out with something like that, you know. But I, I, Incredible to have the both the bands on the same bloody show. Incredible. I mean, it, it showed that, you know, it showed that Madchester uh, had, had made it, you know, whatever that means. But it, it means that people had gone to it, I suppose. That's all I can think of in that yeah. respect. How did you feel about when the Mondays really started to break through after Pills and Thrills and Stefan came out and became this phenomenon? How did that make you feel? I was made up for him. <laughs> Happy as Larry. Go for it, lads. I mean, when they, didn't they play in um, Brazil supporting Queen to like 200,000 people or something? I was just like, wow. You know, oh, so what the fuck was that like? I was made up for a big time, you know, from seeing them in Aldershot in 1986. There was like 30 people there, and then they've got to that stage. Fucking great, man. Bloody great. Good on you. Yeah, bloody great. Can you remember where you were when you found out that Paul had died? I think Jill, I think Jill got in touch with me. I was just at home, just, um, yeah, Jill got in touch, man. Yeah, yes, what, what? No. What? 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 Wow. Huh. Just like, wow. Like you say, it's so, something so out of the blue. Just, you know, someone's ill, you know, and you know that you know, they're, getting, they're getting ill, they're progressively getting worse, or, you know, they're going, you, 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 but just like that, yeah. when he's on tour, just, Bang. Lines on the mirror, lines on her face. <laughs> Eagle song that he once played me. Lines on the mirror, lines on her face. Life in the fast lane. <laughs> and that's, you know, yeah, that's the way he, yeah. Well, the horse that I knew, that was the way that he, you know, when he was playing, that's the way it was. He was, he was a real geezer. He wasn't fake. He was 100% real, you know. Fuck anyone who says he wasn't, because he was 100% real. 
and end life if you can be real. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. When you think of Paul now, what what's the the memory that comes to mind? And he used to call me Mogwai. Did he? Why did he call you? Yeah. <laughs> Mogwai. Do your Mogwai smile. He called me Mogwai, but he, he really meant the, the gremlins, you know. Oh. That's what he meant, but if it's something he called me Mogwai. Chris, give me your smile. Mogwai. Oh. I mean, before that, the, the, excuse me, they used to call me the funky monkey in the far out flares when they first saw me in the Hacienda. <laughs> Right, okay. And you couldn't miss me with these 21 inch bottom pink so they, jumbo they cord flares, you, could you? You literally just met them in the Hacienda and then became friends just from being in the. Yeah, 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 just by being in the, in the Hacienda, a melting pot, a cauldron of culture. The Hacienda is so missed. Well, I don't know, I don't know what the kids are doing these days because I'm, you know, pushing 60 now. So they, hopefully they've got somewhere as. Or maybe it's all stalled on the internet these days, you know. But in my, I, I, I went to the Hacienda in 1983, just as much as I could. And luckily, like I said, my pal Little Mike was a DJ there, so I could get in for now, which is always a bonus when you're skin. <laughs> but I'd go as many times as I could, just because it almost felt like something was going to happen there. All right, it took three, four, nearly five years, but it did. <laughs> and boy did it happen boy did it happen so I don't know was it a calling? I don't know people these days they go oh no no, I never wanted to go to that gaff it's too cliquey that was the whole fucking point of it <laughs> you were meant to be cool to go there you were meant to be clued up to go there it wasn't just rotters or placemate seven or pips or somewhere you just pay to go in you got to know you got to, you got to be in the know that, well that's how it struck me and that's why I wanted to be there, because I like to think I was in the know. Yeah, well, that's, that was what it was. I know it sounds cl cliquey, yeah, so fucking what? <laughs> I want to be in the clique. I want to be cool. I want to know what's going on. <laughs> what's wrong with that? I want the culture. I want the knowledge. What's wrong with that? If you want to have a dance, go to look in school disco. <laughs> Do you have a favourite Monday song? Olive Oil. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I just love his bass line. Dung 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 and it ding ding ding. It's almost like it's out of key when his guitar comes in, but it's just I just love it because it's almost fractured, but it's that's the beauty of it. And that 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 intro bass line, no, it's yeah. What do you think the secret was? Why do you think they captured the imagination of, of so many people in, in the day? when the Because they were real. Because they were real. They were real. That's, for, that's my answer to that, is they were real. If they'd been, they real. If they'd been signed to a major label, that, they, they, wouldn't, try to dilute them. they wouldn't have been they'd allowed. They'd try to mould them. They'd try to mould them and dilute them. That was the one beauty of fact, just went, Go ahead, do what you're doing. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, ah, oh, well, we've lost some money, <laughs> which is great on their part. And they did lose money on the last albums. <laughs> but hey, no. Anthony H. Wilson, Alan Erasmus, Factory Records, God bless them. They were a massive, massive part of Manchester. Massive. They should never be, uh, they should never be forgotten or underestimated. Brilliant. Have you got any more Brilliant. stories any you'd more like to stories? tell about Paul? Not, not off the top of my head. Listen, if anything comes to mind, I'll um, I'll 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 try. I'll, somehow I'll get me into you, yeah. But it's just been great to have a chat with you. Yeah. I really, really appreciate you letting us come in your living room and talk to talk. It's okay. It's okay. No, listen. I'm. I'm. Listen. For us, anything. I would have done anything for him. I'll do anything for him. Now, you know what I mean. All right. All right, lovely. Lots of love, and thank you again. Take care. I'll be, I'll be in touch soon, I promise you. Yeah, sweet. All right. Anytime. Yeah, okay, All take right. care. See you Ciao. Soon. Ciao for now.
that's all we've got for you this week. Please join us again next week where we have the lovely, lovely and hilarious studio owner, Latch, that everybody's been requesting. We finally have got it together to get the Latch episode ready. Be prepared, it's hilarious. Okay, please visit the website at paulrider.tv for all the information to do with all aspects of the show and of Paul Ryder that you might possibly want to know. Please join us again next week where we will be having such a laugh with Latch. And if you're watching this on YouTube, the next podcast episode is being released right now and so uh, go and check it out if you can't wait till next week otherwise we'll see you next week on youtube for the premiere of the next episode eight o'clock where myself and chico will be live in the chat as usual so please do join us have a fantastic week lots and lots of love to all of you massive thanks and love to the amazing really lovely presser and of course big thanks to the man himself the late great paul anthony Ryan. Listening Productions. Yeah.